When I first was introduced to the gospel, it was at the Sumner Church of Christ in Sumner, Washington. I was 17, and we walked in to the church building there, and uh, it just so happened that that particular year, in a congregation of about probably 125, maybe 150, there were 10 babies born. Uh, and so they were growing the congregation, um, but I walked in on a Sunday morning, and I heard, as I sat down, I heard two things. I heard the truth, and I heard babies. And I needed both. Two weeks ago, I preached on the subject of truth, and how Jesus is the truth. And the Bible is the truth. And you can't have any sort of conversation about anything worthwhile without the truth. Our greatest evangelism tool is the truth. You can't, you can't even talk about evangelism without talking about what's right, what's wrong, what is, what isn't. It's the truth. But there's two more really powerful evangelism tools that a local congregation has. We're going to talk about one of them today, and it's families. Because when I sat down in that congregation, I was hearing the truth, but I was also hearing what a family is like. And as somebody who grew up with a dysfunctional family that was not doing it the way God intended, which is very common... I'm not saying that so you go, oh, poor Scott. No, Scott's normal. I was being introduced to this idea that there's a better way. I was seeing husbands, wives that loved each other. I was seeing families that were raising their children in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. And I didn't know what that meant, but it sure sounded good. I was seeing the Bible pattern being played out in family unit after family unit after family unit. And they weren't doing it perfectly. Some of those kids crying were a little old. And they weren't crying because they were hungry. They were crying because they were in trouble. So it's not like I was seeing perfect people. But I was seeing individual family units trying to model themselves after the Bible pattern. And then collectively, when, when the preacher would talk about we're the family of Christ, that only makes sense if you know what a family is supposed to be. The idea of the church being a family means nothing to you if all you've known is dysfunction. In fact, if anything, it might mean something negative to you. You need to see the Bible pattern modeled. And so one of the greatest tools that a congregation has for evangelism is just simply leading godly lives and doing our best to have godly families generation after generation after generation. And that's no easy task. Because the truth is, is that when you see a family that is generationally serving the Lord, you're seeing something that has broken the pattern. They've done the abnormal thing. They've done the thing that is so rarely happening. And so what we want to do is just talk about that. What does it take to have family success? Unfortunately, today the term family planning has a pretty negative connotation a lot of times. But biblically, you should be planning as a family. There is a, a model that God gives us. Proverbs 23 there, verse 15 and 16, my son, if your heart be wise, my heart will be glad, even mine. Yes, my heart will rejoice when your lips speak right things. That's, that's the goal of parenting, is that as your kids get older and they start being grown-ups, 
and thinking and doing and functioning on their own and not asking your opinion all the time and not having to ask your opinion all the time, that they're making good choices on their own. And what happens to the heart of a parent when they see their kid grown and making good choices? Man, that's a good feeling. When all of a sudden they're moving that direction that God intended on their own. That doesn't happen by accident. Godly families, godly marriages are not accidentally grown. They are only intentionally done so. So we're going to talk about five different things that the Bible shows us that can help our families function. Now, once again, I want you to understand, I'm not saying you have to have a perfect family. You're not going to do it right all the time. That's why we preach on stuff. We preach on it because it's, it's all about course corrections and changing and adapting. And I might also mention it's also all about grace. Because you're going to make mistakes. And some of you are going to listen to this and, you, and you're going to say, well, wait a second. I, I don't have, my kids aren't this tall. I'm not starting fresh. Okay. That's okay. The Lord knows that too. All we do is we, we do the best we can where we're at. But the first thing that I, I want you to, to understand is that you're going to need to calculate the cost if you want a godly family. And that starts before marriage, by the way. Calculating the cost isn't something you do once you have teenagers. Calculating the cost is something we should be doing before we walk down the aisle. In Luke uh, chapter 14, verse 28 through 30, Jesus talks about this idea of calculating the cost and that it's something a wise person does. He says, for which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he's laid a foundation, is not able to finish, all who observe it begin to ridicule him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. The last thing you want is to start a project that you can't finish. Now, I got married a month out of high school. And I knew everything. When Jenna and I said, I do, I had no idea what I was doing. What was I agreeing to? I didn't know. But I knew really one thing. And truthfully, this has been all that's built our marriage. I knew one thing, and it had been told me by a godly man who, who at the time wasn't an elder, but became one not long after. And he simply said, Scott, if you make God the common denominator always, your marriage will be just fine. But you have got to always choose God. And that's all I knew. All I knew was that this was a lifetime commitment. I didn't know what a lifetime was, but I figured it's pretty long. And I knew when they said things like for richer, for poorer, and sickness and health, that some of that might show up someday. I was mostly counting on her sticking with me when I was sick and poor. But it turns out it works the other way too. But you should calculate the cost. And then when you have kids, I'm convinced that parenting, 95% of good parenting is get up. You're on the couch, you're comfortable for the first time all day, and something happens with a kid and you've got to choose. Do I sit here and let it keep going on? Because here's very comfortable. Or do I get up? 95% of parenting is get up. You just need that little voice in the back here and just get up. So you calculate the cost. Now, another way to consider it, too, is you should calculate the cost on the other side. Because remember the guy who's going to build the tower, if he can't finish the tower, what do his friends do? They gather around and they ridicule him. There's a cost to not getting up off the couch, right? Now, I, there's a cost to not being the for poorer and for sicker part of your vows. And the cost is that you don't, you don't get where you wanted to get. When you walk down the aisle, you have a picture in your mind of where you want to be. And it's, 
it's never divorced. You know, that's not, that's not what people are thinking when they walk down the aisle. I just want a train wreck and let's get this thing rolling. That's not what they're thinking. They're thinking we love each other. We want to build a life together. We're dreaming together. How do you get from here to there? It doesn't happen accidentally. So I want you to ask yourself, husbands, am I willing to make career changes if it would be what's best for my family? Am I willing to, to tell my boss, I can't come in today because I know my kids or my wife need my time. Am I willing to let that, that business call go to voicemail? Am I willing to give up some of my hobbies? You know, those things that you do, this, this me time. We're real big on me time as a culture. Am I willing to give up some of that me time or them time? Husbands and wives, you've you got to calculate that cost. Because there's a cost on either side. But I'll tell you, when you build what God designed, well, that's what Ecclesiastes 7.8 talks about. Ecclesiastes 7.8 says, The end of a matter is better than its beginning. Patience of spirit is better than haughtiness of spirit. Patience of spirit is better than haughtiness of spirit. What that means is the guy who understands it's going to be a long process, the, the, the wife who understands the, the husband that she married may be a man who wants to be this guy, but he's not that guy yet, and she's going to have to be patient with him. That is better than the haughty person. The, the arrogant person said, I got this. I was a perfect parent. Then I had kids. But the end of a matter is better than the beginning of a thing. Let me tell you, it's great when your kid's born. Oh, that's, a, that's a huge... First time you hold your kid, that's a beautiful thing. But I'll tell you, I've seen something much, much more beautiful. It's what I look forward to. I've seen a godly man or a godly woman, and their life ends, and gathered around that casket are generations of people who love them and have been loved by them, and they served, and, and they know where mom went. And there's a hole that can't be filled because of who mom was. The end of a matter is better than the beginning of a thing. Calculate the cost. The second thing I want you to do is I want you to create a loving home. In Proverbs 31, verse 28 through 31, and, and talking about the Proverbs 31 woman, in verse 28 it says, Her children rise up and bless her, her husband also, and he praises her, saying, Many daughters have done nobly, but you excel them all. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. God, Give her the product of her hands and let her works praise her in the gates. You notice her children rise up and bless her and her husband also. If you are one of those husbands who are like, I told her I loved her back in 1972, that should do it. That is not the way this plays out. Her children rise up and bless her. That is a home of positive affirmation. You know, I, I understand what our culture has done is they said, don't you ever spank your kids, little psyche. No, you won't. But we've gone so opposed as a culture to uh, negative consequences for children that sometimes as the Lord's people, we, we back the other direction. We only give negative. It's like my, whenever my kids hear from me, they know. Here comes dad. No, no, no. That's a family with a, a loving environment. The children know how to give compliments. The husband gives compliments. It's a, it's a joy-filled home. It's a place where people want to be. Um, in Proverbs chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, it talks about the instruction of a father and the instruction of a mother. And in verse 2, he says, When I was a son to my father, tender, and the only son in the side of mother. This idea of this tender affection that his parents had. That's a loving home environment. Do your kids know you love them? 
Do, you, do they know you like them? Those are different things, by the way. There's lots of kids who grew up going, yeah, mama loves me. Mama don't like me. Mama loved me. Do your kids know that? Does your spouse know how you feel about them? Or is the, the day that they die, the things that you would say at their funeral, a bunch of stuff they wouldn't have known you felt? Don't wait. Do not wait to praise your spouse. Do not wait to praise your kids. Don't praise them for doing stupid things. I mean, you've, you've, got to put the, you've got to put the next piece in, right, of discipline. I get that. But if the only time your children ever hear from you is when they do something wrong, what does that tell you you're creating? They're not feeling like the tender son. That home environment isn't the children rising up to bless mom. And the husband's saying, who you are on the inside is even more valuable to me than who you are on the outside. The third thing is, is you, you don't have a godly family. You don't have family success without structure. Proverbs 15 verse 20 says, A wise son makes a father glad, but a foolish man despises his mother. If you do not give structure to your kids, this is the, this is the other side of it. You've got to have boundaries. There has to be right and wrong. You don't have a godly family without right and wrong. You don't have success without right and wrong. Because it turns out that if you just let your kids do whatever they want, they stick forks in light sockets. I mean, that's, it's like, we do, we got to give them boundaries, right? No, don't eat that. One of my mom's favorite stories to tell of me is she made a mistake as a parent and left the house. She was at my aunt's house and they both went out in the garden and locked themselves out of the house. And I was in the house and I was just, just like this chubby little, I had three chins. I was this chubby little kid, probably needed to crawl more. Um, and they're looking at me through the glass. I'm in there, they can't get in. They checked all the windows and everything and so now I think they, they call in my uncle or something like that to come home with a key. And I'm just crawling around, no boundaries. Little kid can do whatever he wants. You know what I did? Climbed up on the first potted plant I could find and ate dirt. And they had to watch. No, Scotty, no! That's what happens with no structure. Your kids need to know what's right and what's wrong. And sometimes forcefully. You won't kill them. They won't die. Proverbs 6, verse 20 through 22, My son, observe the commandment of your father. Do not forsake the teaching of your mother. Bind them continually on your heart. Tie them around your neck. And when you walk about, they will guide you. When you sleep, they will watch over you. And when you awake, they will talk to you. How many parents wish that when their kids go out into the world, they could just somehow be there to hover over them and keep them safe the whole time? Wouldn't that be great? If you had some way to just... Be a protective bubble. Not the fake bubble thing we're doing, but like you could just know that they were always safe. Proverbs says that's what, when you give them godly instruction, they bind it on their hearts and they wear it around their necks. And even when they sleep, it watches over them. Because you become that little voice in the back of their mind. My dad was a woodshop teacher. And so uh, I kind of grew up doing things like that. I enjoy doing things like that. I'm not as good at it as he is. This is a very frustrating thing. Um, but I cannot help whenever I, I break the table saw. I cannot help. I'll go to cut something, and I'll turn the table saw on, and I'll go to cut, and there's this voice in the back of my mind. Did you measure it twice, Scott? Table saw, you can, <laughs> if it's too long, it'll be okay. But if it's too short, you can't put any extra back on. It's because it's my dad. That's the way he would talk. And I can't get rid of that voice. I've tried. It's there. Because that's what your parents give you. 
give them structure and give them the right structure. I might, might also mention along the lines of family that I think that that's also true for your spouse. What you say to them, they, it drives into their heart as to what kind of person they are. And you get the spouse you choose. Something for us to consider in that, that, that regard as well. The next thing is you're going to want to teach work and service in your family. Successful families are ones that they know how to serve others. They have servants' hearts that they understand they're not the center of the world. That was a very devastating truth to come to. I thought the whole world revolved around Scott Meyer. Turns out, you don't. But every child has to learn that. There are some adults who need to be learning that. And the way you learn that, the way you learn that you are not the center of the universe is learning to work for others and to do hard things. One of the tests, I think, of, uh, of how much a man has learned this is, is getting him to dig a ditch. Because one of the great things about digging a ditch, if you don't have a power tool system, none of that fancy stuff, is you hand a guy a shovel. And the guy who's not used to hard work, he's going to do the same thing every time. He's going to look at that shovel and he's going to try and figure out a faster way to do it. But you know what? With digging a ditch, there's not a faster way to do it. There's just a shovel and you. And you just get started. You got to learn how to do hard things in life. Proverbs 17, verse 17 says, A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. We often talk about that in terms of a brother in Christ. But take that back to its original model. Where do we, where do we originally get the term brother from? It's from the family unit. We should teach our kids that they're not just here to get along with their siblings when it's, when it's fun. They're not just here to be a part of the family when there's something in it for them. A brother is born for adversity, for hard things. For when the family has to lock arms and figure out how to get through the difficult things. 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 4 talks about a widow who has children and grandchildren. He says they must first learn, this is the children and the grandchildren, learn to practice piety in regard to their own family and to make some return to their parents, for this is acceptable in the sight of God. Do you realize in 1 Timothy 5 when it talks about if, you're, if your grandma is a widow and you can take care of her, that is practicing piety. It's reverence. You're showing reverence not only for grandma, but for God. We should teach our children, our families, build as part of the family identity very early on that we're here to help each other. My brother and I did not learn that until we were older. My brother and I get along great now. I live in Kentucky. He lives in Montana. It's a great a relationship. In truth, we get along much better now than we ever have. But when we were kids, man, we fought. And never, nobody ever told me that was wrong. Like, I just thought that was normal. And it was normal in a lot of the friends' houses and, 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 and peers I had in school. But that doesn't make it right. Teach your kids to be each other's friends. Teach your kids to... To care for each other in adversity. Teach your kids that as much as mom and dad are taking care of them now, there's going to come a time where they need to take care of mom and dad. And that that's the way it's supposed to work. Ecclesiastes 4 says two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. For if either of them falls, the one will lift up his companion. But woe to the one who falls when there is not another to lift him up. We live in a self-centered, individualistic culture. How many people do you think fit that category of the one who falls when there's not another to lift him up? They've not built relationships with people. They don't know how to have anything other than a me-centered world. 
Your family will be successful when you teach your kids that it isn't just about them and so that they should help their siblings and also build a family identity that all of you as a family go and help people. Go mow some little old lady's yard. Go, go and deliver something to somebody who's sick. Go and do things as acts of service as a family. You know, volunteer at a food kitchen one time and have your kids stand in line and, and, and ladle out food for people. It won't kill them. Teach them to be servants at heart. Build that as your family identity. And then the last thing is not here last because it's least important. It's here because it's most important. Your family will be successful when you choose God every time. Not most of the time. Half measures are as bad as no measures. You need to choose God every time. And the times where you fail, you need to tell your kids, we failed. I led poorly. As husbands, we have to, we have to own that. As the leadership role, part of leadership is the buck stops here. And if, if you blow it, okay, you need to tell them you blew it. But I love the, the story of the Philippian jailer in Acts 16. I love it for a lot of different reasons. One, just the providence of how God brought that together. And, and this jailer who was you know, kind of in the, the antagonist role with Paul and Silas ends up being converted. I love the zeal of the Philippian jailer that that very hour of the night he's baptized. Like he's not waiting for Palm Sunday or something, you know. But I also love that when he asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? In verse 31, it says, they said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him together, together with all who are in his house. And he took them that very hour of the night and washed their wounds and immediately he was baptized, he and all his. This Philippian jailer didn't have everything squared away, but when he had an opportunity to hear truth, he didn't say, I'm going to hear it. He said, my home is going to hear it. When he had an opportunity to, to learn what it took to be saved, he didn't say, well, that's good for me, and then just let the rest of his family do his thing. He, he gathered all his household. Is serving and learning about God a family identity? Is it part of who you are? Preachers can be the worst of this. I, I will own that. You know, there's a reason you have preachers, kids, and the kind of stereotype that comes with that. It's because you get a preacher and he's just on fire for the Lord. And he's going to serve and he's going to preach and he's going to pound that pulpit and he's going to be out everywhere teaching everybody people in his own house. There's a danger. Don't leave your kids in Egypt. Don't let the things that come along with life, you know, look, sports are great. And I think there's a lot of wonderful things we can teach our kids through sports. But I'll tell you, you will do them a lot more service if on Sunday, if there's a conflict between the game and the worship, the game gets cut, not the worship. And you just tell them, that's how we are as a family. And you tell the coach, that's how we are as a family. And your kid will learn, the game went on without them, and nobody died. And then they will also learn what matters in the big scheme of things. Because the chances that your kid has a pro career are pretty small. But the chances that your kid are going to meet Jesus are pretty high. So choose God every time. And when we as God's people model it in our individual families... When we talk about being the family of Christ at Eastland, it makes more sense because the individual family units then build 
the local church family so that we know what it's like to be a family and to serve and to put God first and to love each other and to be there during times of adversity and to forgive and be patient and gracious and always move onward and upward. The invitation song at this time uh, we're going to sing is whatever they're going to put up on the chart. It'll be there, I promise. If you've not obeyed the gospel, but you know that you need to be baptized, the Bible is so very clear on the subject. The baptism is the point in which your sins are washed away. If you are ready to have your sins washed away, if you are ready to obey Christ, do just like that Philippian jailer. Just do it now. Don't wait. Don't put it off. If you know what you ought to do, do it. And if you are a Christian who needs to turn back to the Lord and you need the help of the family, the family here loves you and we wish to help. If we can help you with that, uh, please come forward as we stand and sing. Oh, angels are singing redemption's song, wonderful things.